Uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Oren Wright. I'm a research scientist at the SEI's Emerging Technology Center. Uh, Saya Venetti actually leads this project, but because she's chairing the session, I was asked to step in. So Saya alluded to this, this kind of new field of machine emotional intelligence. It's at this confluence of AI and human-machine interaction. And one of the uh, topics in this area that's gotten a lot of attention recently is microexpressions. And I'll explain what those are in just a minute, but uh, they're extremely good indicators of the emotion that someone is feeling. Uh, but the technology right now is, is just okay. It's uh, academic, it's contrived. And so we wanted to see what we could do to move microexpressions technology towards a DOD mission application. And so we asked ourselves, what could we do to improve the recognition accuracy of these systems? And how could we implement these systems uh, in an architecture that lends itself to real-time or near real-time application? So the best way to explain a microexpression is to show it to you. Uh, and if your eyes are anything like mine, you might have trouble just detecting what is actually being displayed. So if we slow it down, let's see if the video is working. This, uh, this slight pinching of the eyebrows is indicative of surprise. Uh, this is something that's, that's hard to catch for a human. It's even hard to catch for a machine because these things are uh, fleeting. They're very short in duration. They're very low in, in intensity. However, they're particularly good markers of emotion because they're involuntary, they're universal across cultures, uh, and they're very difficult to suppress or fake, unlike uh, a normal uh, expression like a smile, for example. Uh, if these could be leveraged, there's a whole host of defense and intelligence applications where they could be uh, useful, such as security checkpoint encounters, all kinds of media analysis and exploitation, uh, and recognizing things like uh, stress or PTSD in warfighters. So the, uh, the face you see is, is Matt Gaston, our director at ETC. Uh, he modeled for us under considerable duress. Um, <laughs> On the left, you see a, a commercial tool. You can look it up online if you want. It's called Affectiva. And it's actually quite good at recognizing facial expressions, uh, a smile, a frown, a furrowing of the brow. Where this breaks down is it uh, assumes that those are indicative of what someone is actually feeling. And as you all know, it's very easy to smile when uh, you're up on here uh, giving a talk and you're actually quite nervous or uh, you're furrowing your brow uh, to, to simulate anger when you're not actually angry. Um, Microexpressions, on the other hand, as I've said, are, are very indicative of what someone is actually feeling. But there are a set of uh, engineering challenges to overcome if you're to detect and recognize these successfully. So as I spoke about, there, the, the nature of microexpressions itself is challenging. But there's also uh, significant problems in how the data uh, are, are managed and what data are available to us today. Uh, these data sets are contrived. They're small. We have only a few hundred videos available to us. And so we have to be creative in uh, how we apply these. So this is a, a brief overview of the architecture we selected. And uh, I'm not going to, to belabor all the details, but the, the key elements I'll talk about today. Uh, in particular, um, we are using two streams of data, which is different than previous approaches. Previous, previous approaches have only looked at the frame-by-frame -frame pixel information, and we added a, a second stream of what's called optical flow data. This is a measure of change between frames. This is actually inspired by how the visual cortex works. You have a ventral stream which recognizes objects and a dorsal stream which recognizes uh, motion. Uh, the second uh, key uh, element we introduced is using uh, deep neural networks, convolutional networks specifically, 
uh, as opposed to handcrafted features which have been used in the past. So the, the first step is uh, we run video data through, through an array of pre-processing. Um, one of the important elements uh, when thinking about real-time application is how much data do you need to, to really work on to successfully recognize microexpressions. Um, and so we used a graph embedding based approach to uh, downsample video, but instead of simply uh, downsampling naively, you might say, uh, we did this in a, a spectral graph theory based way to actually preserve all the dynamic content you see in a video. So you could go from uh, 100 frames of video down to 20 or 10 frames while still preserving all of the changes you see throughout that video. And this is very important for uh, any kind of real-time application. Uh, and as I talked about, we have these two streams of data being fed into two neural networks. The first is a, a spatial CNN. Uh, thankfully, there's a ton of work in computer vision right now. Uh, and so there's a lot of already trained perfectly good spatial convolutional neural networks out there. So we were able to make use of, uh, of pre-trained networks. So we used VGG16. Uh, the, the standard is changing very rapidly, but this is, is as close to standard as you can get right now in uh, the neural network space. Uh, it's been trained on over 1.1 million images in the ImageNet database. So this is a, a way of leveraging other people's work uh, the temporal CNN, we had to, uh, to train ourselves. Then all of this information is fed into a single support vector machine. All of these convolutional features uh, are fed in and scored for each video. Um, so against a, a baseline of roughly 63%, we saw uh, an improvement to 67% for uh, just the spatial architecture of what I showed you. Uh, and we're, this week, we're actually in the midst of generating uh, spatial and temporal results together. So I don't have uh, something to uh, show you today, unfortunately. But on the right there, you can see a, a confusion matrix. This is actually a class-by-class -class breakdown of the accuracy of, uh, of how these systems work. So on the, uh, the vertical axis, you can see what uh, a, a true class is, surprise or happiness, for example. And uh, across the horizontal axis, you could see how the system uh, predicts based on uh, what the information is. Uh, so this is a, a test case you might run this system on, is, is poker players. Uh, here, a, a poker player, is the, the last card's been revealed. He knows he's won. He stands to win well over a million dollars. Um, and a, a, a system like ours could actually recognize what he's feeling. So that, uh, <laughs> that slight pursing of the lips there is indicative of happiness. And a microexpression system would say, hey, maybe this guy has a good hand. So there's still a lot of exciting future work in this space. Um, I won't go through all of it, uh, but in particular, I'd like to call attention to uh, all of the, the pre-processing stuff that hasn't yet been tried. Uh, in, in machine learning in general, clever pre-processing is often one of the, the resources that goes relatively untapped. And there's all kinds of things like uh, Eulerian video magnification that could be attempted. Um, also uh, important is this system was just recognizing microexpressions that we know are present. Uh, a, a key step in moving towards mission application is coupling this with a, a detection system that works on long form videos. Um, another important step is what do we do about the databases? Uh, as I said in the beginning of the talk, the data available to us are very limited uh, and they're very contrived. They're, they're constructed in a laboratory setting. And so we need to ask ourselves what we can do to make this uh, translate to a, a more general set of scenarios that we might see in a DOD application. Um, a long term, this is part of a passive biometrics portfolio that the SCI has been working on. 
uh, which we think is very important to human machine teaming in the future. Uh, this includes a, a demonstration that Satya did last year on extracting heart rate from video. Um, and then this coming fiscal year, we're actually collaborating with a group in the Language Technologies Institute on campus to uh, work on extracting emotions from the human voice. And uh, with that, I uh, can take questions. Yes. Tom Christian, Air Force. Just an observation, this is really important to us in the Air Force, and I read a paper recently in the popular press that dogs are really good at this. Huh. Over thousands of years of evolution, they can read a human face and know exactly what you know, they need to do. So since the dogs aren't talking about how they do it, you might want to talk to some of the neurobiologists who are working in that area and just sort of see if they have any ideas and then compare and contrast that to the approach you're taking. And it'd be interesting to see how good we can get compared to a dog who's had a couple of hundred thousand years of perfecting this. Yeah, that certainly would be interesting. I got one here right here. Yes. So um, I down, while you were doing this, I downloaded the app from Affectiva, uh -huh. looked at myself, and it was kind of interesting that, uh, I mean, these are f very fleeting movements. Yeah. And they're temporal. So uh, while you might see that little smile on that uh, gambler's face, uh, a, a second later, you might have seen a frown because you might have been thinking of something else. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you integrate that over time to really get a read of a person? Yeah, so, so part of that is the, the challenge in simply being able to detect microexpressions, but what, what you're getting at is how do you actually separate one microexpression for another, and that's, that's still a challenge that remains to be solved in any kind of robust way. Like I've said, these systems are very academic right now. Yes? So um, I like the fact that longer term you're going to bring in audio, you know, auditory um, senses. Yes. But the thing is, humans have more than just those two senses. So of course. How, how, do you, how do you subtract out? How do you know aromatherapy wasn't put in the room at the same time? So, I mean, are you trying to actually understand them independently or how they combine? Well, uh, right now we're, we're going kind of sense by sense, if you will. Uh, but we think this is all moving towards a multimodal approach where we'll have all of these technologies working together and classifiers taking data from all of these different modes of sensory perception to uh, uh, better recognize, understand, and, and respond to human emotion. All right. I think that's all. I'll be in the back after the session. Thank you. <laughs>